Hello everyone, this is Christine Smith and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Padlet today. Um, before I get started, I do want to talk also about a new place that I have found to get some great tutorials for online teaching and learning. It's called New Ed Tech Classroom. It's hosted by a man named Sam Carries, who is a teacher out in San Francisco, and he does a really excellent job of describing different types of apps that we're all very familiar with, but taking it to the next level in terms of how you incorporate these into digital instruction. Um, he does a lot with Google Slides as HyperDocs. He um, also talks about Padlet. He talks about other apps that uh, would have been really useful for him, and he is really quite good at breaking it down into all the steps that you need to follow to create a really good digital lesson. And so it is full transparency. I did watch his video on Padlet. And so I'm just going to highlight some of the things that stood out to me, um, things that I've learned over the course of the last few months. And I've used Padlet for years, but there are still things that we can all learn. And rarely do we have to go to the full extent of learning an app when it's serviceable for us in terms of what we need at that moment. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of things that I thought were important to know. Uh, for those of you who've never used Padlet before, you can go to padlet.com. You can sign up for a basic plan, which is free, and that allows you three Padlets, three bulletin boards. Um, if you need more than that, then there is a paid plan. Um, if you want students to be able to have their names show up in the attribution line of things that they post, then they will need to belong to Padlet. They will need to have an account, so you would have them sign up with the basic, and then they could use their Wheeler Gmail account to be able to do that. Um, just check on the COPA compliance for being able to do that. So the first thing that you need to know is you, after you've signed in and you want to make a Padlet are the steps that you want to follow. So I'm going to log in with Google um, because that's how I did sign up my uh, for my account with the school's Google account. And then... Um, here you have all of your options, and these are the different ways that you can use Padlet, and I think they're worth taking a look at. The ones that I typically use for a class, and for example, for my information skills classes, I have them post their work to a Padlet because it's a uh, quarter-long work project, and so it's easier for me to check in and see what they're doing and write comments um, if they post it to a Padlet right at the beginning. And then I know also that everybody at least has a starting point. So I will typically use the wall, um, which is just, as it says, it's sort of a layout in a brick format. I will also use the grid um, where you can arrange content in rows. And I created a Padlet for what students are reading this week in middle school. And this is the format that I used. And then the one that I really like is the shelf. I typically use this, um, especially, as I said, for information skills and tech core, because then I can in each column, create either the name of the project that I want them to post there, the date of the project, um, the quarter in which we're working. So it allows for a lot of great organization under that shelf format. A couple of things that I picked up, of course, is the back channel, which is a great way if you want to just do sort of a chat environment. And finally, the map, which I discovered when we were getting ready to do the Quahog Cup. And one of the activities in the past had relied upon a paper map. And we were able to find that this was a great interactive way for students to be able to locate a place, uh, type in what they knew about it, um, add some information. Um, so it was a, a nice addition. And again, something new that I learned over the course of our distance learning about Padlet. For the purposes of this demonstration, I am going to use the grid format. So they're starting my Padlet, and you can customize your Padlet. I'm going to call this my Padlet tutorial. And I am going to say it's for the Tutorial Tuesday. And then down here, you can start to customize it. So you can customize the appearance. Um, you can do pictures, textures, gradients. I particularly like solid colors, and I particularly like bright solid colors because I just think it's a nice contrast for the background. You can also, or you can add your own. If you have an image that you would prefer to put in as the background image, you can add it right from there. Then over here, as I continue, I'm going to, this is where I was talking about the attribution, where it says display the author name above each post. That can only happen 
if you have an account in Padlet. And that's where we go back to that idea of having students sign up for accounts. Um, and I would say that this is why the eighth graders can use it for their digital portfolios. I'm sure they're quite proficient with this now. Um, I would also say, um, you know, that you really need to uh, maybe run this by the tech office to see at what grade level or at what age level uh, they would think it would be okay for you to have the students sign up for accounts. You can enable comments, which is um, really a great way to have, to get student feedback on a project or on a quick book review or something. Um, of course, you'd have to set classroom guidelines in terms of what the comments should be should be, how they should um, conduct themselves in an online environment um, when they're commenting on other people's work or contributions. You can also have reactions, which um, you can, they can like, they can vote, they can, you know, put a star, uh, give it a grade. For the most part, I leave it on none simply because I think that can become somewhat competitive, how many people like your post. Um, and we all know that on social media that can be uh, sort of daunting and maybe a little damaging um, if, you know, there are more popular posts than others. So I just leave that off to uh, not encourage that. And then you can decide to require approval depending on your topic that you're covering with your students. You may want to make sure that you get a quick read of something before it goes public. Um, and that's fine. Uh, it also means that you have to be moderating the Padlet so that you don't get a backlog of things that need to be posted. Uh, one of the things that I like about Padlet for me is the immediacy of being able to just pull it up there and see who's already posted to it and be able to address any posting problems in terms of if they've put the right link in or if the video isn't working. But you can certainly require approval if uh, that's what you would prefer to do. And then you can go to next and you are really ready to start posting. There are, however, some other things that you may want to do. So over here, for example, you can invite certain people um, and I'm just going to put in a name that I know is in here, has a, a person who has an account. Um, just to show you now, Becca Hunsker and I work together on the Folklore Fair pa Padlets, so I know she's here. And um, I can then give her permission to do any number of things on the Padlet. I can set it so she can only read it, that she can write on it, she could edit it, where she could view and edit and approve other posts, or she could administer and she could modify the whole thing. And typically, because we are working together on the Folklore Fair Padlet, um, she becomes an administrator on it. And so that I will save. And then the next thing that I want to take a look at is the privacy settings. So I'm going to close this and I'm going to go back over here um, and I'm going to look at share or embed. And this is where you can um, set up your privacy. Now visitors can write because I do want the students to be able to post things to the Padlet. But I also want to make sure that it's somewhat protected. And so for the purposes of pretty much everything that I set up now, I do use a password. Um, and I will, for example, I'll just pick an easy one here um, and let the students know what it is. But this way, it's not quite as wide open. Somebody like who's not, who doesn't have access to this or doesn't have access to the password wouldn't be able to get to the Padlet and be able to add to it. So it's just another layer of privacy and security that I like to add. Um, and so I will save that. And now I'm ready to start posting. Um, and this pass, you know, it says password protected. It gives me lots of different ways that I can share it down here. One of them is you can share right on a Google Classroom, which is really helpful to me because what I do is I typically will choose a Google Classroom like uh, the Tech Core class, and I will just post it. I'll choose an action. In this case, I'll just create material, and then I can just say go. And here it is. And now I can add all the specifics to what I want them to be able to post to the Padlet, but it's right there. So I find this really helpful. And as I said, it's it's an easier way for me to keep track of an ongoing project than just having them share it with me from Google or the fact that with an assignment, you know, they'd have to turn it in. This way I can see it before the assignment due date. So I'm going to click away from that, but that's a good thing to know. Um, of course, there are lots of other ways you can embed it and you can copy the link to a clipboard, which I typically will do also. Um, and 
with all of those sharing settings and privacy settings in place, I'm going to go over and just take a look. So